Well, good morning, and uh, thank you for having me. It's an honor to be here to speak at the SUNA meeting. A lot of familiar faces, and it's a very prestigious group that's dedicated to the urologic care of patients. So, again, thank you. So I'm going to talk about BPH, benign prosthetic hyperplasia, the focus and treatment protocols. And I am a paid speaker for Neotract. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about their product in this talk as well as others. So our learning objectives today, we want to describe the anatomy and physiology of the prostate. Define what BPH is, benign prostatic hyperplasia. Discuss the impact of LUTs and untreated BPH on health and quality of life of our male patients. List the screening and diagnostic tools available that we have for BPH. Explain the BPH algorithm of care. And discuss the various treatment options currently available for men with BPH. So benign prostatic hyperplasia is the clinical term that we use for an enlarged prostate. And BPH is very common. Um, it can definitely affect the quality of life of approximately one-third of men over the age of 50. More than 70% of men in their 60s have symptoms of BPH. And if we look histologically, up to 90% of men at the age of 85 years of age have BPH. So if men live long enough, virtually all men will get BPH. And this impacts approximately 14 million men in the U.S. And they have lower urinary tract symptoms indicative of their BPH. So the anatomy and physiology of the prostate gland. So the prostate starts out roughly about 18 grams um, at 18, when men are you know, in their early 20s. It begins to grow after that. It's a small walnut-sized gland. It's a muscular gland with glandular components. It's in the inferior portion of the bladder. It sits between the pendulous urethra of the penis and the bladder. And it plays a role in secretion of the ejaculate. It makes approximately one-third of the ejaculate volume. And it also has an impact on the urination. And it consists of both exocrine glandular tissue and fibromuscular tissue. So a lot of the medical therapies that we use for BPH are impacting both these tissue types. If we break down the anatomy and physiology of the prostate further, we can look at four distinct zones of the prostate gland. The peripheral zone is the outer cortex. When we do a digital rectal exam, this is the part of the prostate that we're feeling for. This is the zone where prostate cancer arises. And this is why we can feel prostate cancer on the exam, because it is in the outer cortex of the prostate. The central zone is the zone that goes around the ejaculatory ducts. This is what feeds the seminal vesicles that make 70% of the ejaculate into the prostate. So during ejaculation, this zone helps expel that ejaculate out of the urethra. The anterior zone is the fibromuscular portion of the prostate. And then the transition zone. This is the zone right around the prostatic urethra. So this is the zone that grows with BPH. And this is the part that obstructs the prostate over years of growth. So when we look at the prostate gland, the normal size is the walnut size, and it slowly increases in size with age. Now this is genetically determined. It's not based on diet. It's not based on uh, history or lifestyle. It's based purely on genetic predisposition. So often if a patient has a father, an uncle, grandfather that had an enlarged prostate, there's a high probability they will have similar problems. So the pathophysiology of BPH, this occurs primarily in older men. So older the man becomes, larger the prostate is. Hyperplasia process, which results in the enlargement of the prostate gland, and this enlargement is a glandular component of the prostate that grows. It may restrict the urine flow by constricting the prostatic urethra. So the urethra goes right through the middle of the prostate, almost like a hole in a donut. So as the prostate grows, it impinges that urethra, and this leads to the signs and symptoms of BPH. Now, the bladder is a muscle, the detrusor muscle. And when that bladder has to work against an obstruction, the muscle becomes hypertrophied and thickened. And the problem with a thickened bladder, it's non-compliant. It holds less urine, leads to a lot of the urinary symptoms of frequency and urgency. So this thickened bladder can also be more sensitive to urge spasms, which can lead to urge incontinence in the severe cases. 
And over time, if the bladder isn't alleviated from this obstruction, it can get to a point of becoming weak, fibrosed, and even complete failure where patients become catheter dependent. So when you see this progress of the bladder slowly becoming obstructed, we start to see increased post void residuals. And that's the early signs of obstruction. And if this continues on, eventually it can lead to complete acute urinary retention. So there are many symptoms that occur prior to that end stage process. So if we look at the progress of BPH disease, on the left, you're gonna see an open prostate channel. This is looking with the cystoscope inside the prostatic urethra into the bladder. So that black portion that you see is the portion looking into the bladder itself. Let's see if I could show you there. So right there is the bladder, and this is the prostatic urethra with the prostate transitional zone right outside that. So here's the prostate with a moderate enlargement. You can no longer see the opening into the bladder, and you can see the lateral lobes slowly obstructing. And here we have actually kissing lateral lobes. So this is a near complete obstruction. So this patient is gonna have a significant problem with voiding and emptying the bladder. So how do we monitor and gauge BPH? Well, we use symptoms. And we have an International Prostate Symptom Score, IPSS. This is a questionnaire a patient fills out so we can get an objective assessment of how bad their symptoms are. And we gauge these symptom scores on a scale of one to five. They circle you know, zero for no symptoms, one for mild, five for severe. And the questions all surround themselves around the incomplete bladder emptying, urinary frequency, intermittent stream, urgency of urination, a weak stream, straining the void, and then nocturia with waking up at night. So many men who suffer from BPH and the symptoms of LUTs experience reduction in quality of life. Um, no doubt that the impact of the voiding pattern can have a big impact on their work and, and leisure lifestyle. Disruption in sleep patterns, often leading to urinating several times at night, could affect not only the patient's sleep, but their partner's sleep too. Anxiety over the impact of BPH on sexual activities. Um, avoiding travel, especially long car rides or being in areas where you're not sure where the bathrooms are. Um, interruption of leisure activities because of that, and anxiety and sensitivity over using public urinals due to voiding concerns, and concerns of overperforming activities in a daily living. And this can often lead to clinical depression. When patients go through this process, they're changing their work life, they're changing their leisure life, and often patients will get a significant depression from this. Men will often downplay their symptoms too, and when we have them fill that IPSS questionnaire, I find it very helpful to actually go over it with them to really accurately depict what their symptoms are. Um, sometimes we'll write out, you know, if you have three-time nocturia, that's a four or five, which is a severe form of uh, symptoms, and often the patient will put a zero or a one. So it's important to really have the patient uh, go through that with you so you can get an accurate assessment of their symptoms. So complete medical history is very important when you're evaluating a patient for enlarged prostate gland. Uh, the medical history is important because they may be on other medications like diuretic therapy, which can lead to a lot of frequency. Their water intake is important and the timing of the water they have if they drink a lot of fluids at night. Um, so knowing that part of their history is gonna help curtail their treatments. Physical examination includes the digital rectal exam, which is the basic and that should be done in every patient, not just for prostate enlargement purposes, but it's still the best exam for prostate cancer detection. There's been a little bit of misconception among other healthcare providers, not in the urology arena, about not doing the digital rectal anymore, and a lot of the primary care docs are, are not doing it as often, which makes it even more important for us to really emphasize to our patients the importance of doing the digital rectal exam, because it is the best most sensitive test to detect prostate cancer in the early stages. The bladder ultrasound is important to get post void residual. Again, a good indicator if they're emptied or not. Often patients say, you know, I empty great, and you scan them after they void, and they have 10, 15 ounces in their bladder. So you know they have obstruction. And that's important part of educating a patient on their condition. The assessment of symptoms using the IPSS score, we break it down to mild, moderate, and severe categories. So this is very helpful in directing patients in therapy. Certainly the patients with the severe symptoms need a more aggressive approach versus the mild. 
And the optional studies that we often get in patients are urine flow tests, essentially having a patient void in a urine flow, which measures the flow rate of the urine. And we also categorize this as a mild, moderate, severe obstruction flow. The pressure flow studies is a little bit more advanced. This is where you actually measure the pressure in the bladder. There's a urine cuff system where you can do avoiding pressure flow, which is very helpful because when you see a high bladder pressure with a low flow rate, that's indicative of obstruction. And sometimes you'll see a low flow and there's not much obstruction because the bladder pressure is low from a weak bladder. So the pressure flow does help differentiate obstruction from non-obstruction. So if you're not doing that in your office, it's something to talk to your uh, colleagues and, and, and partners with about getting a, a pressure flow machine in your office. A transrectal ultrasound with or without biopsy. Biopsy is just done if we're thinking about prostate cancer. We don't do it for BPH. Um, but the ultrasound is a very accurate tool in measuring the prostate volume. And the prostate volume is important. We treat the symptoms, but the size of the, pro the prostate often dictates what we do for the patient. Cystoscopy is very helpful too. This is the only way we can directly see and visualize the degree of blockage. This is also important in determining what treatment options might be the best for the patient. So untreated BPH, you know, why should we be aggressive in treating BPH? Well, it can lead to bladder deterioration. And the deterioration can be significant. When you have deterioration of the bladder, detrusor muscle, you tend to get higher risk of infections because the bladder will not empty all the way when it becomes hypertrophied. When the bladder gets that hypertrophy, it becomes so thick, it's very difficult for this bladder to contract and completely empty that urine. Bladder stones then occur because the residual urine in the bladder calcifies, and that crystallization and calcification will lead to these bladder calculi, which can also harbor bacteria, which can lead to recurrent infections. And eventually, if your bladder pressure becomes high enough, and the ureters that travel through this portion of the bladder near the trigone, they become obstructed and that leads to a nephropathy, an obstructed nephropathy causing acute kidney injury, often irreversible even if you fix the obstruction at that point. An acute urinary retention is the end stage obstruction. That's when men completely obstruct, block off, often end up in the emergency department when this occurs. So we don't want patients getting to this end stage condition because often it is an irreversible point even if we fix the block prostate. So how do we treat BPH? Well, for the mild symptoms, watchful waiting is completely appropriate. Maybe some dietary modifications, changing their water intake, timing, avoiding the wheat drinking at night, sometimes arranging maybe their diuretic therapy to different types of meds or different timings of when they take their diuretics, eliminating caffeine or minimizing caffeine, which elevates bladder pressure, which leads to more lower urinary tract symptoms. Um, so those are the first-line therapies. The treatment options range from least invasive to most invasive, like most conditions. So we always want to start with what's easy to do and safe for the patient. So when we begin with medications, that's the first-line therapy. Then these minimally invasive therapies, the prostatic urethral lift and thermal therapies for the prostate, those are the sort of the middle of the road treatments. And then the more aggressive therapies, the laser therapies and the surgical therapies for the prostate. And the goals of these treatments is to improve the patient's quality of life. That is the end point. That's what the patient wants. Um, they want a reduction in their LUTs, their lower urinary tract symptoms. What we want, we want to prevent further serious health complications like we talked about, infections, complete bladder failure, kidney failure. So that's why we need to treat this. So BPH options include the herbal therapy, phytotherapy. You know, again, patients like this option. It's a billion dollar industry because patients don't have to go through a healthcare <laughs> provider. They can go to their vitamin store or go online and buy these treatments. These companies are very aggressive in their marketing. Um, remember, they're mandated by FDA not to be regulated. So the FDA does not regulate these companies unless they want self-regulation. And they can do that, but most of these companies do not. Which means there's very little data, peer-reviewed published data, on these phytotherapies. So we're not sure if they work. We're not sure how safe they are. 
The only way we know they're not safe is when they're pulled off the market because they harmed people, and that has happened with these vital therapies. I am a pro-vitamin person, so I'm not against this industry. You just have to go in it with caution. So the disadvantage of this, again, it may not improve the symptoms. It can worsen symptoms at times. Potential downstream issues with these medications, with side effects. And future treatments may be less effective if you take some of these phytotherapies. So BPH treatment options using pharmacological prescribed medications for the prostate. This has been around for a long time, and a lot of these are very effective. The alpha blockers, the alpha adrenergic antagonists like Flomax and Rapaflow, it helps relax the muscle and the prostate gland, which opens the prostatic urethra. It doesn't stop the prostate from growing, so sometimes the patient may get initial relief, and over time it doesn't work anymore. So just because they have initial response, you have to keep monitoring these patients if they progress out of it. Um, the alpha, 5-alpha reductase inhibitors, like Proscar or Finasteride, this helps shrink the prostate and slow future growth down. It's, it's relatively safe. Uh, we like the treatment, but it does take sometimes three to six months to work. So if patients are having acute symptoms and want acute relief, they're not going to get that with a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor. Um, there's also some side effects with that. But the advantages of these medical therapies is no surgical intervention. It can be uh, helpful in symptom relief right away with the alpha blockers and over time with the 5-alpha reductase inhibitors. And uh, disadvantages are sexual side effects, and this is a big one. So both these medical therapies can have severe impacts on the ejaculatory function. With alpha blockers, it can eliminate the ejaculation. And the 5-alpha reductase inhibitors can cause decreased ejaculate volume permanently. There's also a potential risk of getting higher grade prostate cancers on 5-alpha reductase inhibitors uh, found in two studies. Um, so there's some potential side effects with these meds. Overall, they're good. I like them. They're not for every patient, and when patients are on them, they should be continued to be monitored to make sure the medications are doing what they're supposed to be doing. Um, the IFIS, that's like floppy iris syndrome that happens with Flomax or Rapaflow, and this affects having cataract surgery. It's very difficult for the ophthalmologist to do that surgery without damaging the cornea. So they have to come off these meds for at least a month, and sometimes even then, it doesn't go away. So that's something we need to tell our patients when they go on these alpha blockers. If they have cataracts, they may want to address those before doing this. So BPH treatment options that are minimally invasive, and, and the prostatic urethral lift is the latest technology on the block, although it's been out there in uh, Australia and Europe for about five years, so we have five-year data on it. It's newer in, in the U.S. Um, in this state, in Illinois, we've had pretty much broad-spectrum Medicare and insurance coverage since June of last year, so you probably haven't seen a lot of these yet. Um, but it is minimally invasive, typically done in the office. It can be done under straight local or with IV sedation. In my office, we have IV sedation, so we utilize that. It does not involve cutting the prostate, eating the prostate, or removing prostate tissue, which is nice because when you do that, you affect the prostate physiology, which, again, its main function is sexual function with ejaculation. So if we can minimize any effect on the male ejaculatory function, most men, especially the younger men that have this, really appreciate that. Um, delivering the device is placed through the urethra, so there's no incisions made. It's done like a cystoscope, and it's done right inside the prostate under direct vision. And we put these small little implants right through the prostate, through the actual cortex around the capsule. And after we put that pledge in there, it actually squeezes or impinges the prostate, opening up the urethra. So it just anatomically alleviates the blockage without removing the prostate. So this treatment alternative for, for which patients? These are patients who do not want to be on medications long term, either because of side effects, the costs, or just not that effective. They've tried BPH medications, but are just not happy with them and do not want to undergo a major surgery. So this minimally invasive treatments are for the patients that have sort of the moderate blockage. They're not the ones that are in urinary retention with these huge prostates with the severely tuberculated bladder. Those patients sort of miss this option, and they're going to go right towards the surgical or more aggressive options. 
Now the contraindications for this treatment, if the prostate's greater than 80 milliliters or 80 grams, now the prostate's become too big. This treatment will help, but it's not as effective as the other surgical options. And obstructive median lobe. When the prostate grows, I showed in that one anatomy, the lateral lobes move in. Well, once in a while, about 15% of the patients, they get this middle lobe moving up, and it acts like a ball valve. Well, that lift where we push the lateral lobes out won't treat that middle lobe. So if we see the middle lobe, this prostatic urethral lift will not be very effective. So when we look at the uh, prostatic urethral lift before and after, um, it gives you an idea of what we're looking at. You, you can't really see the lift device because after about three weeks, the epithelium grows over the lift. So what happened here is we're pushing this prostate. You can see the right side, and this is patient's left, but our right side, it's open more than this side. And that's just because of the way the patient's anatomy is. You can see this lobe is a little bit bigger than that lobe, and that's not unusual. But the end point is you can see in the bladder. This is what it looks like in an 18-year-old. There's no obstruction. And this is done without removing the prostate, without surgery, and using that minimally invasive technique. So the patients do get rapid relief in symptoms. They have preserved sexual function. They have temporary postoperative urinary catheter, but usually about 90% of patients do not need a catheter at all. Um, they return to full activity usually by a week. I tell patients, you know, don't do any heavy lifting or straining or working out for about two days. Um, and usually after that, they're ready to go. Um, and sometimes they'll have a little bit of burning, a little bit of urgency, a little bit of frequency. They really don't start to see real improvement in avoiding symptoms until about one to two weeks. And then uh, the peak effect would be two months out. Because not only does the prostate obstruction cause the symptoms, but that thickened trabeculated bladder causes a lot of the symptoms. So when you alleviate the obstruction, the bladder doesn't have to work as hard. And a lot of that hypertrophy is reversible. That's why you see this delayed benefit after we treat the obstructing prostate. Then we have the thermal therapies. They have been around for about 20 years. They have improved over that time frame. And this is done either with a microwave heat energy, a radio frequency heat energy, or a steam injection, which is a newer um, option. Um, the advantage of this, it's, it's minimally invasive, done in the office, sometimes with a twilight anesthetic, sometimes under straight local. It's definitely less invasive than a surgery like a TERP, which is the transurethral section of the prostate. And typically minimal bleeding, um, very rare incontinence, and very rare <coughs> affecting erectile function. The disadvantages often is the catheter, and that's a hang up for a lot of guys when they know they get treated and they have to have a catheter in for a week or two or sometimes three. It, it really turns them off as a minimally invasive procedure. Um, and, and there is a need for the catheter often for you know, that up to three weeks sometimes. And it does take longer for it to work. The, uh, the microwave thermal therapy takes about three months to actually to work. The steam is a little bit faster, but there's a lot more irritating symptoms. So they're all really good technologies. Um, they're nice to do in those moderate patients, and it's also nice to do in sort of the higher risk patients. Um, I have nursing home patients that don't have very big prostates. I don't want to put them under general anesthetic. These are nice options for those patients. So BPH treatments using laser therapies, which is the more severe BPH patients. So this is high energy laser vaporizing the prostate, actually removes the prostate tissue. About 50 to 80% of the prostate is actually removed by vaporization. It does work well with pretty immediate relief, less bleeding than the surgery, um, the shorter duration of postoperative urinary catheter versus the surgery. It's similar to TERP in efficacy and durability. The TERP has some advantages with the really big prostates, but this one does quite well if the prostate's not overly big. The disadvantage, it can take a few weeks, sometimes a month to recover. There's complications of a little bit higher risk of incontinence, erectile dysfunction, and complete loss of ejaculatory function. So again, we do this in patients that are just more severe with their symptoms. And then BPH treatments with surgery, the TERP, um, transurethral section of prostate gland. This has been around for over 80 years. Uh, has a proven track record. It is aggressive. It's done in the hospital. Um, typically, it's about a 45-minute uh, procedure. 
The patients stay overnight one or two nights with CBI, continuous bladder irrigation, because of the bleeding. When you cut into the prostate, we cut into the venous sinuses, which means they absorb a lot of the water irrigation we use during the procedure. This water irrigation is salt-free. It's not saline because that won't allow us to cut with cautery, so it's water or glycine, which is a hypotonic solution, uh, a common complication we used to see with these terps, and we did a lot more of them in the past, was patients would absorb a lot of this free water, and this would cause a hypotonic environment in their bloodstream. This would lead to hyponatremia acutely, which has caused acute neurologic disorders, confusion, and even sometimes the CVA. And when you get a hypotonic serum, that causes the red cells to lyse, and red cells have a lot of potassium in it. So when your red blood cells lyse, you have a huge release of potassium, you get hyperkalemic, and this is causes dysrhythmias. So this is called TUR syndrome, very important to monitor after a TERP, okay? And this is something that um, you know recovery room nurses really need to be on top of because that's usually when these symptoms present. Um, but it's still considered the gold standard because it's been around the longest and has the best long-term uh, results. Uh, but again, if we treat the patients at an earlier stage, we can do less invasive treatment options with excellent outcomes. So when we compare all these treatments head to head and we break it down in categories uh, as symptoms relief, complications, and convenience. And they all have their strong sides and downsides. The minimally invasive treatments, which are the middle options, these are sort of the newer technologies. And when these technologies are developed, they were really keeping the patient in mind and focus and also looking at early intervention, not waiting till men completely obstruct before intervening. So when we treat patients earlier, we have a lot better outcomes. And with the prosthetic urethral lift, you know, certainly we hit all the check marks here. With the thermal therapies, we hit almost all the check marks. We get to the surgery, it works great, but a lot more side effects and risks. And the minimally invasive medications or phytotherapies, they are good, but these are the ones that we would give patients in the very, very early stages. But the problem with these younger men, with these mild and large prostate symptoms, the medications cause the sexual side effects. And these are the patients who are most concerned about that side effect. So the men tend to be non-compliant because they see these sexual side effects of either loss of erectile function or they'll see re de reduced or eliminating ejaculatory function. So we always have to keep, again, we've talked about the patient satisfaction of their voiding symptoms, but also the side effects and tolerance of the treatments. And if the treatment side effects outweigh the benefit, they're not going to take it. So in summary, BPH is a non-cancerous enlargement of the prostate that occurs as men get older. It impacts the health and quality of life of about one-third of men over the age of 50. And remember, these guys don't complain a lot. You know, the 50-year-olds don't want to be on a medicine. They don't want their prostate checked. This is like a, everything new is happening to them. They don't want to get poked and prodded. But it's important that we really push these patients um, to understand what BPH is and how early intervention is going to prevent future problems. If left untreated, it can lead to bladder deterioration and serious complications, and it could be permanent deterioration of the bladder. The treatment options range from minimally invasive medications all the way to the highly invasive surgical option. Um, the advanced minimally invasive prosthetic urethral lift system is a viable alternative treatment option, and these minimally invasive options are just getting better and better. And nurses and case managers can play a vital role in achieving the patient's treatment goals and significantly improving their overall health and quality of life. And sometimes this is just through intervention. If you have more time with the patient than the doctor in the office, it's good to ask about these questions and ask them how bothered are they. And if their spouse is there, ask them, are you bothered with all his voiding symptoms, running to the bathrooms, short trips and frequent stops, waking up at night three, four times? And often they are, and they may not even be telling their spouse that. Um, so it's important to, to both educate the spouse and the male patient. So again, thank you for uh, being here. I enjoyed doing this talk. I did one about 15 years ago, so it's great to be back here today. Um, if you have any questions at all, please ask. And I know we talked about filling out that evaluation form. 
and that certificate for attendance, so you can get the extra credit for that. Um, if there's any questions, yes. So, can you explain why the sexual function is not an issue with the urinal? Well, what it does, the urolift lift is placed right in the prostatic urethra and not at the bladder neck. So when a man ejaculates, the bladder neck contracts, so it actually cuts the bladder off from the prostate because the sphincter is on the other side of the prostate. That's what keeps you dry. So when the sphincter opens for the ejaculation to come out, if that bladder neck doesn't close, urine comes out you have a reflex of a nerve. If that bladder neck doesn't shut, the sphincter won't open, okay? So if we open the bladder neck surgically, when you ejaculate, that sphincter stays closed and ejaculation will not come out. You still have ejaculation, because remember 70% of the ejaculation is not from the prostate, it's from the seminal vesicles. But now it just sits in the prostatic urethra, nothing will come out until the patient voids. Then it'll come out mixed in with the urine, it won't back up in their system or hurt them, but you're just not going to have that satisfaction. Yes? How extensively do you check out to make sure they don't have DAT when you go in? Yeah, that's very important. So definitely they need to have a digital rectal exam and a PSA. And I am a big advocate of continuing doing PSAs. We have other tumor markers that we can do beyond PSA, but PSA is still covered through insurance and Medicare and it's still very sensitive, so it finds the cancer, but it's not very specific. A lot of times the PSAs are high and there's no cancer. So I, I recommend doing digital rectal, PSA, if they're both normal, meaning no signs of cancer, then you can proceed with your BPH therapy. But the cancer treatment would come first. So the standard, what's the problem? The, 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 it's a Eurolift. Okay, Eurolift. Have you ever had to remove any? Is it difficult to do that? Or? You can remove it. So often when doctors are first learning how to put it in, if they put it too close to the bladder neck, that's going to affect the sexual function. You have to remove it out. And you grasp it, and it literally just pulls right out through the prostate. So they can be removed. But it's very rare. I never had to remove I probably have about 100 patients going through this. Never had to remove any of them. They're MRI friendly, so I don't have to worry about that because there are little metal pledgets on them that keep them in place. And they don't uh, set off any kind of metal detectors at an airport or anything like that. Yes? Just to clarify what you said before, when you see lift, there is still retrograde ejaculation or not? There is not. So that's one of the very few treatments that do not have retrograde ejaculation. Okay. Even the medications, you get retrograde ejaculation. What about the volume? The volume goes down with age, but the volume will not change with the Euro lift. No. Yes? No, there's not a limit that will affect an MRI. Um, sometimes there is a limit of what the insurance will cover. Okay, often we put in four to six, that's the average range. Um, usually if they're beyond six, their prostate's probably too big to really qualify for the Euro lift. Yes? It's very rare, in my experience, it's been about maybe 4%, 4 to 5% of the patients. And these are patients I was pushing the envelope a little bit, bigger prostate glands. Those are the ones that are likely not going to do as well with the Eurolift. So if they have a very big prostate or if they're what I call fast growers, those prostates just keep growing, you can outgrow any treatment. Even a TERP can grow back and reobstruct, and they may need another treatment down the line. Yes, you can still TERP them. You can still do a green light laser. So I always tell patients, you're not burning bridges by doing the minimal invasive treatments. If they work for a while, but you need something in the future, you can still do those future treatments. Yes? Are you doing these under local or general? I would say 95% of these done in this country are done under local. Um, I'm in the 5% because my office, we have full anesthesia right in my office. So it's very convenient 
for me to just to utilize our anesthesiologists and our nurse anesthetists. On your low quality, doing a prostate block? Or? Yeah, um, it's mixed. Some are doing prostate block with an ultrasound guide. Uh, uh, most are actually just doing a cold lidocaine gel in the urethra, and you put a little clamp at the end of the glands penis to keep the urethra lidocaine in there for about 20 minutes. And then they're giving them some oral pyridium beforehand and maybe like a lower tab or a, a Norco before the procedure. And that's it. And it's very well tolerated. It's not much more than a cystoscope. Yes? Question. Is a foreign object in the prostate, do you find that in patients who have prostatitis or any infectious problems? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so we don't want to put these in when there's an active infection. So if there is an active prostatitis or UTI, you want to treat that first, then put this in. But there has been no increased incidence of infections or requirement of removal of this because of an infection or an infected implant. Yes? What is the product And you have to come back and check it out Yeah. Sure. So the question is, you know, if you have one of these, does it affect how you do a TERP or a green light laser of the prostate? The answer, it does not. You do see these. So when we do the TERP, we cut through the prostatic urethra. We literally cut right through the implantable device. Okay, and then the actual metal component of it comes out. Okay, so it's very easy to do. The laser does the same thing, but it vaporizes the tissue. It superheats that little metal pledget, which breaks the suture, and then that metal comes out. So you do see it during the treatment. You see a flashback, and that's it. After it hits that once, it'll superheat and actually break the, the suture material that it's connected to and come out. Yes? Uh, no. Sure. So the migration, like we see with brachytherapy, we implant the radioactive pellets in the prostate. They have been known to migrate. You get them in a venous sinus, and then you can, they find them in a lung someday, you know, and they're radioactive, so that was always a concern. But because these are connected to um, a, a pledget or a type of stop, they don't migrate at all. So wherever you put them is where they're going to stay. For migration? You, yeah, the, the, the key thing in putting these in is you need to stay about a, one and a half centimeters away from that bladder neck. Because often what happens when you look inside the prostate, um, when you distend it with water, it stretches that prostate gland open, and it's hard to sometimes see where the bladder neck junction is. If you're too far into the bladder neck or bladder area, then you do have to remove those. But they're not gonna move once you place them. Because you're placing them essentially with a needle through the prostate. So you made a hole, and you put this pledget right through that hole. So it's not going to be able to go anywhere from that point. So it's where it's put in initially, you know, is going to affect where it's going to end up down the line. And, and that's a learning curve. It's not unusual. I think that's the hardest part of learning this procedure. It usually takes about four or five for the urologist to get comfortable with. And the, the biggest struggle is where to put the ones near the blood or neck. Not to go too far in, but not to go too far distal. And, uh, and once they figure out that spot, then it's very reproducible in other patients. Does this complicate this yeah, It does not complicate it, but there's a, there's, a, there's a small chance, you know, if you're putting in a needle to put in the seeds, that you can hit one of those little suture lines that are holds the, it would be a pretty tough shot, but it, you could hit it and loosen it up. But we feel that after these have been in for a few months, that squeezing of the prostate this causes actually leads to a fibrosis in that prostate that keeps that compression. 
So it's no longer the ural lift holding that open. The prostate scarring that happens keeps that open. So likely it wouldn't impact it a whole lot. Yes? They have uh, over five year data now and they looked at the symptom scores and the flow from the beginning to five years and it had durability. So we saw very little reduction in the symptoms. Now remember the prostate's a dynamic gland. It doesn't just stay static, it continues to grow. So that's where you're gonna lose your symptoms. You're gonna get worsening symptoms in a guy who has continued prostate growth. Um, that's why even a TERP, we usually say it lasts you 10 years, because that's how long it takes to grow back. Um, so these minimally invasive ones will probably be under that 10 year marker. So in a guy who's younger, they may require another treatment, okay? Either this treatment again, which you could do again, or if there's a newer technology down the pipeline, you haven't burned bridges. Yeah, the, the, the bleeding component, you know, you are putting four puncture sites, sometimes six, into the prostate. The prostate is very vascular, that's what bleeds. And often, if these prostates are really enlarged or big, the vasculature in the prostatic urethra. Is, is more significant. So the older patients tend to have bigger prostates, they tend to have more bleeding. I do recommend stopping all anticoagulation, all the antiplatelet meds, even fish oil and vitamin E. These all will increase the bleeding. What about catheters that have to be? Is that case by case? Yeah, case by case, you know, again, a little bit of a learning curve in putting these in. So if you're able to put them in in an atraumatic fashion, the bleeding is actually very little. If you're, if you're still learning, you're gonna have a little more bleeding. It's probably safer to leave the catheter in these guys overnight when you're first learning. Often what we do, because the patient's already numb, you fill the bladder at the end of the procedure. If the patient can avoid just fine and the urine isn't that dark, they go home with no catheter. But if they're having trouble voiding or you're not comfortable with how red the urine looks, just place the catheter in right there. They're already numbed up and overnight it'll save them the headache of coming to the emergency department later that evening. Yes? Are they remaining on pharmacologic agents as well afterwards? Um, no, they can stop all their pharmacologic agents. What I usually do is I keep them on it for one more month. And my thinking behind that is the prostate does swell a little bit from the procedure. There's sort of a healing phase going on. So during that time frame, I like having the medical therapy on board still. All right. Well, again, thank you very much. It was a pleasure being here.